masters almost surely have a plan There's clearly maybe something there beyond the realm of man Until we've thoroughly tested every last close-chested view Find the more you think you know, the less you really do Where would we be without THC? We know the lying to us just don't know to what degree Where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show Greg Carl Wood and Company yourself people from sunny san diego i'm greg carlwood and it's pretty clear society is on shaky ground with too many people living under a high degree of stress and irritation with very little direction in their lives and if we reverse engineer many of our problems and why so many adults seem behind in creative problem solving discernment emotional intelligence and independent thinking all roads lead to having to take a good hard look at the education system in this country Not only have we been slowly slipping further down the list in most major categories for as long as I've been alive, but our mandated school system seems to have been, quite possibly, crafted with ill intent from the ground up, with investors in the system just looking to get more bodies on the assembly line as opposed to nurturing anyone that could actually become their competition, emphasizing gold star accumulation and pats on the head from authority figures over almost anything else breaking down the independent spirit of children in exchange for a regimented, oppressive structure that is a closer match to prison than an optimal learning environment, conditioning us to respond to bells and lockstep and preparing us for an adulthood where your work is never really done, and those who can't conform are often labeled as slow from an incredibly early age or drugged until they feel appropriately numb. And if this all might sound like I'm going a bit too far, take a good look at the quality of food offered to our growing youth at some of the most important times in their development and tell me if it seems like they want optimized, healthy, robust children. Well, lucky for us, there are incredible people out there fighting for much better alternatives like today's guest, Carrie McDonald. Carrie is a senior education fellow at the Foundation of Economic Education and hosts the weekly Liberated podcast. She is also the author of Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside of the Conventional Classroom, as well as being an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, Education Policy Fellow at State Policy Network, and a regular Forbes contributor. Carrie's research interests include homeschooling and schooling alternatives, self-directed learning, education entrepreneurship, parent empowerment, school choice, and family and child policy. She has a master's degree in education policy from Harvard University, a bachelor's degree in economics from Bowdoin College, and she is front and center in the very encouraging unschooling movement. So let's get into it. The education educator, parent, empowerer, and increasingly important unschooling advocate, Carrie, welcome to the higher side. Hi, Greg. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is a real pleasure. Your book is Excellent. I appreciate the deep dive into the history of our education system, the data we have regarding how it affects children, and all the great alternatives that you highlight. And I like the term unschooling, which you write is simply living and allowing your children to live without the specter of conventional schooling and school like thinking. It is the act of fusing living and learning, of seeing them as one and the same. And it's hard to disagree with that. But elaborate a bit for us, if you could. How does the philosophy behind unschooling compare to the philosophy behind conventional government schools? That's a great question. And I do kind of explore the history of the term unschooling, as well as sort of the philosophical roots of unschooling or self-directed education. I use the terms interchangeably throughout unschooled. And the term unschooling was actually coined in 1977 by John Holt. He was a renowned author and educator. He wrote the best-selling books, How Children Fail and How Children Learn in the 1960s. And he became a real leading advocate for homeschooling and for parents opting out of government schools to educate their own children using the resources of their communities and really pushing for the self-directed approach to allow children's interests and passions to drive their learning instead of just sort of replicating school at home. So he really pushed for what we would 
think of as more of this unstructured approach to homeschooling and not just changing the location of school to home, but essentially importing all of those same characteristics of school with top-down expectations and curriculum and evaluation that we might see in sort of standard homeschooling environments. And so really, you know, unschooling and self-directed education are truly the opposite of what we would consider standard schooling. It's a much more bottom-up approach, much more decentralized, really, again, focused on an individual child's interests and passions and having that guide learning. And the sort of fundamental premise, as I'm sure you can appreciate as the father of a a young child, a toddler at this point, (laughs) I mean, young children are naturally curious and creative. And especially, I'm sure you'll see over the coming months and years, you know, they, young children are incredibly inquisitive. They're always asking why. They're always eager to explore the world around them and figure out what things work and how things work and why they work that way. And the sort of idea with unschooling is that those natural drives for learning can continue, should continue, will continue if we allow children to continue to learn in that really exploratory way that they're given the chance to do when they're young by simply not placing them into this kind of traditional schooling structure. And the person who wrote the foreword to my unschooled book is Boston College psychology professor Peter Gray, who also wrote the book Free to Learn. And he's a real advocate for unschooling and self-directed education and a critic of forced schooling and, and compulsory schooling. And he will say, too, that, you know, sort of these natural drives for learning and discovery don't turn themselves off when a child turns five or six years old and heads to kindergarten. We turn them off with our coercive system of schooling, to paraphrase his insights there. And so I think that's just the sort of the general idea is let's just allow that creativity and curiosity and those natural drives for learning to continue throughout childhood and adolescence. Yes, that is a great setup. And You made a good point there about kids in their youth before they reach the school age. And that's something I was going to bring up that is in the book a lot. You talk about the way we tend to think about kids at around the age of five or so when they start school, we allow them to kind of grow and learn naturally for the first five years. And then it's going to kindergarten. And much like maybe the puberty stage of life, we've talked ourselves into thinking that there's this other stage of life around five where playtime is over, kids need to knuckle down, and that declining childhood creativity is just a natural consequence of growing up. But with unschooled kids, we see something totally different, right? Yeah. So a couple of things there. First, I would say that really just even in the past generation, we've seen schooling take over much more of children's lives and adolescent lives than ever before. We have schooling starting at much younger ages, many children sort of in daycare, preschool. Now we have universal, you know, government preschool in some areas and pre-K programs. So that that standard schooling structure begins in some places much earlier than age five or six and extends much later into adolescence. You know, it was the case certainly when I was a teenager that, you know, teens in the afternoon had after school jobs or would work on weekends and would have summer jobs. And today, not only is teen labor force participation down to sort of record lows, but you also see that in place of the kind of real life work experience and some of these other experiences as outside of school, today's adolescents are, you know, frequently doing academic things. They're continuing to do sort of school like activities, even in the after school and summer vacations and so on. So forced schooling has really come to define so much of childhood and adolescence and consume so much of young people's lives today, much more than it was even a generation ago. And along with that is this sort of push for expectations, academic expectations down to younger ages, so that at this point, you know, kindergartners are expected to read. And if they're not reading by the end of kindergarten, they're often labeled as reading delayed. And all that's changed there are the expectations around kindergarten and early childhood development and learning not the children themselves. And in fact, there was an interesting research study done by researchers at the University of Virginia who found that in 1998, only about 30% of teachers surveyed, kindergarten teachers surveyed, said that children should be reading by the end of kindergarten. And 
And just 12 years later, in the passage of No Child Left Behind at the federal level and a push towards kind of standardized, more standardized education, by 2010, 80% of teachers said that children should be reading by the end of kindergarten. Again, all that had changed really was the benchmark, not the children. And that's where we're seeing, and we can go into this, I'm sure, in, in our discussion today, but we're seeing kind of skyrocketing rates of children being labeled with ADHD and other sorts of maladies because in many cases, they're just simply too young to be doing academic work that, again, a generation ago, we wouldn't have even expected them to do. Mm-hmm. Great points. And on the subject of benchmarks, I'm actually a little curious because I hear a lot of maybe hyperbole, and then I just don't know where the truth really is in terms of the last couple of years and what COVID has done and the distance learning and all the policies around that and how it affected kids. I've heard that kids are drastically behind traditional benchmarks. I've heard that it's really not so bad. I've even heard that the benchmarks themselves have been quietly change, the bar has been lowered so that it's easier to climb over because they know that there's been some setbacks because of this. What are your thoughts on all that? Well, I think there's a couple of interesting things with that that point, and certainly all of these media headlines screaming about learning loss, pandemic learning loss over the past couple of years of remote Zoom schooling through one's district. And certainly that was suboptimal and a disaster for some families with school districts simply not set up to perform, you know, remotely. In other cases, it was a way for families to actually see what was happening in their children's classrooms and maybe realize the curriculum wasn't actually that great to begin with, whether it was in person or virtual. But either way, certainly the focus right now is on this pandemic learning loss. And I had an article not too long ago at fee.org where I basically said the issue here is not learning loss, it's schooling. It's sort of the, you know, we've talked about this for years with summer slide, which was the term used to describe this alleged learning loss from students from the spring semester, then learning loss over the summer, and then they come back in the fall and have forgotten what they learned in the spring. And, you know, I made the point over several years, including in the unschooled book, and now again, in, in terms of talking about this alleged COVID learning loss that, you know, content that can be so easily lost was never really learned authentically to begin with. You know, I mean, if it's so easy to lose all of that content, was it ever really something that students really learned and had kind of internalized? And sort of the same idea that, you know, if we graduate from high school at, say, 18, if we can so quickly lose what we've supposedly learned over all of those years, again, what does it say about the quality of that learning? And so that's sort of the, the main point there, that the quality of schooling and this kind of memorization and regurgitation that happens in conventional classrooms isn't really learning. It's sort of playing the game of school, making sure you give the teacher the answer that he or she wants and that you regurgitate correctly on a test, but it doesn't necessarily signal that you're actually learning meaningful content. And then sort of the larger point is you'll much more likely learn content when it's tied to your interests and passions, when it's kind of self-directed, driven by you as an individual in pursuit of your own goals and objectives. And I'll also say and another, you know, sort of another viewpoint on that is I've talked to education entrepreneurs and micro school founders across the country, especially those who create these kind of outside of the system, non-traditional education options like microschools and learning pods and homeschool collaboratives. And I talked to one microschool founder recently in Kansas who had worked for years in the Wichita public schools as a teacher, had then left to create a tutoring center, which she turned into a full-time microschool during the COVID response because her parents really wanted something formal and not just a kind of part-time tutoring program, and they didn't want to send their kids back to the district schools. And during her time of working with the tutoring center and then formulating the micro school and then looking at this supposed data on learning loss, you know, she said that really this just exposed kind of the low quality of learning that existed even prior to COVID. It just now people are more attuned to kind of those low expectations and those low performance benchmarks. Right on, right on. Yeah, I love hearing examples like that. And great points. It's not really about the COVID policies. It's about the bad foundation. It's like the distance learning just through 
gasoline on an already pretty bad educational dumpster fire that we have. And you also made the point that it did give parents an opportunity to get a closer look at their kids' education, and a lot of them didn't like what they were seeing. I find it really exciting, actually, just how many different sectors of business during the last couple of years saw how little control they had when it came to things like lockdowns and their Many people pivoting to make sure they don't fall into the same situation. Independent holistic health doctors are on the rise. More business owners are looking into the private membership association structure, which gives them more freedom. Networking and local community action has never been stronger. And in the education sector, this seems to be really popping off. Can you give people a sense of what this counter reaction really looks like across the country and how many new options families have now that they might not have had just three years ago? Yes, that's such a great question, Greg, because I, you know, I think about the education disruption or transformation really over the past couple of years, I like to put it into buckets of what I call the three E's. So there's empowerment, exit, and entrepreneurship. And so you had this parent empowerment certainly beginning in the spring of 2020, where parents actually had a close-up look at what was happening in their kids' schools and in their classrooms. And then certainly throughout the rest of the kind of academic year, 2020 into 21, continue to kind of see the ways in which local district schools were not responsive to parents' needs. And yet private schools and parochial schools were much more responsive because, of course, they had bills to pay and they wouldn't be able to stay open if they didn't accommodate the families that were choosing them. So we saw them much more adaptive and creative, really, in kind of getting back to normal as quickly and safely as possible. So parent empowerment, certainly in 2020, we also saw the rise then in 2020 of what were called pandemic pods, which were really these co-learning communities or co-ops that came together spontaneously. Families just realizing that school was going to stay shuttered or was going to continue being remote for an indefinite period of time and families realizing that they had to take matters into their own hands and to make sure their kids were getting that necessary social interaction and continue to learn the academic content that mattered to them. And so that they ended up forming these you know, parent-driven learning pods, either with taking turns as parents leading a pod or in some cases hiring an adult educator to facilitate a curriculum. And what was really exciting is that through that process, we saw in 2020 and 2021, a real exit from assigned district schools. We saw the U.S. homeschool population more than double, according to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2020, to more than 11% of the U.S. K-12 school age population, or more than 5 million students. And the biggest driver of that exit, of that growth in the homeschool population were Black homeschooling families. Black students became overrepresented in the homeschool population compared to the representation in the overall U.S. K-12 public school population. There was a five-fold increase that year, according to the census of Black homeschooling families. And now, even though you know we're more than two years into this and schools are back to normal, we still see declining enrollment in many places and homeschooling rates still well above pre-pandemic levels and families really continuing to choose private schools, parochial schools, obviously homeschooling, micro schools is now roughly 2 million students attending micro schools full time, which are sort of these hybrids between what we would think of as private schools and homeschooling. And charter school enrollment has also gone up. So even though now we're, you know, several academic years into this, we're still seeing districts in many places lose enrollment. The Boston Globe just talking recently about Boston public schools down again enrollment this year. And I think it's just because parents really have been empowered to take matters into their own hands, to search for other options, to create other options and to collaborate with others to do that. And, you know, you asked for an example, so I can give you, uh, I can talk all day about some examples, but Mm -hmm. I'll give you one that I think speaks to what you're talking about with PMAs, these private membership associations that have really come on the scene and I think been really popular and certainly serve an important purpose. One example is an education entrepreneur who I interviewed for my podcast and have written about her, Jill Perez in New Jersey. She was a longtime public school teacher in New Jersey. And when COVID hit, She ended up creating a pandemic pod with some other families, didn't want to subject her kids to remote learning and kind of COVID policies in the classroom. And so throughout the academic year, she and 
several other families met and continued learning and having that social interaction. And it became so popular with other members of her community that they urged her to do something more formal. So last year in the fall of 2021, she ended up leasing a building and opening a full, full-time full micro school with about 45 kids. And she hired educators, public school teachers from New York City public schools who were burnt out and fed up with the kinds of ongoing COVID policies that they were contending with and remote schooling and all the uncertainties and unpredictabilities that they had to contend with. And she was able to recruit them into her micro school. She said, you know, I can't pay them as much as they're making in the New York City public schools, but I can offer them that creativity, that flexibility, that freedom that they're missing in district schools. And this is the kind of example that we see, certainly that I see across the country. Jill set up her program as a private membership association. Interestingly, New Jersey is one of the easiest states in the country to homeschool in. They have very light regulation of homeschooling. And so it's easy to kind of gather families together in these voluntary communities to create these co-learning spaces. And so it's been really successful for her. And I'll just add one more thing. It's been so successful that she ended up purchasing a building for her micro school and continues to expand. Mm, Beautiful. Well, examples like that are great. And the fact that she's expanding is even better. But you do bring up something I wanted to dig into a little more with you, and that is that not all states are created equal when it comes to homeschooling freedoms or the lack thereof. Can you fill us in a bit more on which states are out on both the good and bad extremes when it comes to this? And have there been any new laws passed in the wake of the last couple of years that stick out as shining examples when it comes to what we want to see in education optionality? Yeah, I mean, I think There's so much to unpack there. Certainly, there are states that are low regulation of homeschooling, obviously, New Jersey being one of them. And then some states like New York that are you just, again, right next door to New Jersey, but are among the most difficult to homeschool in. One of the things I've been spending the past year doing, though, is talking with education entrepreneurs, these micro school founders and creators of learning pods and other non-traditional models across the country about what some of their challenges are as they try to start their programs and try to scale their programs. And it's interesting to kind of see where there are these hubs of education entrepreneurship. I think of, for example, South Florida, where I spent a lot of time over the fall. There's a real cluster of micro schools there, majority minority owned, majority minority students in those micro schools. And they're able to access these micro schools through Florida's robust school choice programs. They have tax credit scholarship programs that allow income eligible families to attend some of these programs, which tend to be lower cost than traditional private options more generally. Micro schools are often a quarter of the cost in some cases of traditional private schools. They're these intentionally small, mixed age, one room schoolhouse models, usually under 50 kids. And really with that personalized mastery-based curriculum. And so we're seeing those clusters there. Florida also tends to be very uh, kind of open to entrepreneurship. And unlike the rest of the country, remained open during 2020 and 2021 and kind of encouraged more entrepreneurship there. So they're ahead of the pack. And then I'm also seeing clusters of education entrepreneurship in states without robust school choice policies. I think of, for example, in Kansas. There's a real cluster of education entrepreneurs in the Wichita, Kansas area, another state that tends to be really easy to open businesses in and be an entrepreneur in. And so even though there's no school choice policies there, it tends to be a low regulation state for these education entrepreneurs and innovators. So they're able to try something new and get that off the ground. But that's a key issue is just making it easy for these education entrepreneurs to start and scale their organizations by removing barriers that they may be facing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, and I had heard that Arizona just passed a great law for educational choice and West Virginia is doing some good things. I don't hear much about California. I know I have to leave this state for a lot of reasons, but I do think that's one of them. I did hear through the grapevine that at least locally in San Diego, there's a bit of an issue with the unschooling movement. I mean, it's happening everywhere. So there are groups here, but I guess legislators or the government is coming in and like, I mean, we're, we're required 
nationwide for kids to go to school. And so I guess the state can kind of decide what qualifies as a school and they don't think a bunch of kids playing in the park qualifies as a school. There's some of that struggle going on here from what I understand. Well, I think there's always a tax on homeschoolers and certainly non-traditional learning models. Anything that's outside of the norm tends to um, maybe confuse people, especially policymakers (laughs) who like to put people into standard boxes and certainly don't like competition with district schools. I will say, though, that California is another state where it's relatively easy to homeschool. There's lots of homeschoolers there. It's also relatively easy to start a private school. So it's interesting that some states that we would think of as highly restrictive in some areas, high regulation states for some sectors can be easier when it comes to non-traditional education and homeschooling, that doesn't mean that it won't still entail some battles and some uh, (laughs) fight for liberty among homeschoolers and unschoolers there, but tends to be easier. Interestingly, in a policy paper I wrote for State Policy Network earlier this fall that kind of looks at some of these key challenges that education entrepreneurs encounter across the country, I talk about a report that came out in 2021 by the Cato Institute that ranked the state's according to how friendly they were toward entrepreneurship. And this was in all sectors, not just education, but all sectors, including highly regulated industries like alcohol. And they found that in the top five states for a kind of entrepreneurial friendliness, low regulation for entrepreneurs was Colorado. And yet when I talked to education entrepreneurs, some of them said that they wouldn't even think about going to Colorado as they scale their micro school networks and so on because it can be so difficult to be an education entrepreneur in that state. So that shows, too, that even states that could be friendly toward entrepreneurs in other sectors might not be friendly to entrepreneurs in education. And it's just state by state. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good points. It's a mixed bag everywhere, it seems. And to get a little more into the history of the American education system, another good line in the book, one of yours actually, is that American schooling was designed to strip the joy of natural learning, of following the human will to explore and discover, in favor of conformity and compliance. I agree, but talk to us about that word designed, because a lot of people might think our schools have been neglected, that they've slowly eroded in quality. But to say they were designed to produce a lot of the problems they produce is another thing. What can you tell us about the history of the American school system that shows this to be the case? Right. So in the book, I trace the history of American education and compulsory schooling dating back to the 17th century. So soon after the pilgrims arrived in what became Massachusetts Bay Colony in Plymouth in 1620, about Two decades later, they passed the colony's first compulsory education laws that required cities or towns of a certain size to provide educational resources. So smaller towns were required to hire a teacher and larger towns and cities were required to open and operate a grammar school. And so at that time in the in the 17th century, the compulsion with education rested on the cities and towns and municipalities to provide educational options to families that wanted them. And yet, at the time, you also, throughout the colonial and revolutionary era, had a whole mix of education options. You did have these public schools that were in these cities and towns required by law to be created, but you also had a wide assortment of private schools and charity schools and church schools. You had what were known as dame schools, which we would consider little in-home nursery schools in your neighbor's kitchen who would teach kind of the three R's to young children. And homeschooling was, of course, the default during the colonial and American revolutionary eras. And apprenticeships were really the key pathway for adolescence into adulthood. And all of that really changed beginning in 1852 with Massachusetts, my home state, leading the way again in compulsion with passing the country's first compulsory schooling statute, 1852, now requiring all parents to send their children to an assigned district school under a legal threat of force. And that was really a shift from, again, the compulsion being on the municipality to the compulsion being on the parents. And I think that that was the moment where we really did see this shift of design to compliance and conformity. If we think about what was happening, certainly in the Boston area in the early 19th century, early to mid-19th century, there was 
a tremendous amount of immigration. The city of Boston doubled in size between 1820 and 1840. And most of that immigration was coming from Irish Catholic immigrants to Boston who really challenged the dominant Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture of the time. And people in Massachusetts didn't like that. You know, just a couple of years before Massachusetts passed its compulsory attendance law, the Massachusetts state legislature said, and I'll quote, those pouring in upon us in masses of thousands upon thousands are wholly of another kind in morals and intellect. And this was a true, you know, anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant sentiment that was pervasive in Massachusetts and in the Boston area at the time. And then that really led to the creation of compulsory schooling and this sense that all children had to attend these what were known as common schools. The architect of that was Horace Mann, who was instrumental in passing that first compulsory schooling statute based on the kind of Prussian model of learning that he was so enamored with. And what was interesting is that even though these common schools at the time were supposedly secular, They had all Protestant teachers and texts, and they were, you know, for all intents and purposes, what we would think of as Protestant, trying to kind of mold these young children into the dominant culture of the times. And and it's really interesting because a lot of these Catholic families rebelled and they started creating their own parallel system of parochial schools throughout the latter part of the 19th century. So we're not sending our kids to these purportedly secular, but obviously Protestant common schools. So they created their own system of private schools. And that all came to a peak in the 1920s when Oregon tried to ban attendance at any private schools. They wanted children to only attend public schools. And at the time in Oregon, really the only private schools that were in existence were parochial schools. There weren't independent private schools. And thankfully, the U.S. Supreme Court shot down that Oregon law in the landmark Supreme Court case of Pierce versus the Society of Sisters, where they said that the child is not the mere creature of the state. Hmm. (laughs) Well, that is a great history lesson. And the quote you read, I feel like I could hear that even today uh, in a lot of cases. And the fights, the struggles seem to be similar today. There's a lot of talk about educators sliding in their cultural beliefs or their political or religious views that really have no place in the classroom. And it just seems like that's a tale as old as time. But Horace Mann, we have talked about him before and the Prussian model, more of a militaristic, regimented type of system. Obviously, that is what we have if you just examine it. But something I didn't know that I learned from your book is that Horace Mann also created the nation's first mental institution in 1833. So people can make of that what they will if they thought that went very well. (laughs) But you make other great points about the myths we've been told as to why national compulsory education was developed. One of those is that we were told that illiteracy was rampant in the 1800s, but apparently that's not all that true. Yeah, I'll just say one other thing about Horace Mann that's really interesting is he homeschooled his own children Ah. while (laughs) mandating compulsory schooling for others. And if you read some of his writings, he had a lot of contempt for parents, you know, calling them hostages to our cause and so forth really this disdain for parents and especially, again, these parents who kind of conflicted with the dominant cultural ethos of the time. So, right. So at the time, there was this sense that, oh, or at least historically, the narrative has been that we need a compulsory common schooling because of low literacy rates. And yet, if you look at the data, it will show that we actually had quite high literacy rates in Massachusetts, upwards of 90 percent literacy rates at the time that compulsory schooling laws were passed. Certainly, you know, it was illegal at the time for slaves to be taught to read. And I talk in my book actually about some slave communities where they actually defied those laws with the thirst for knowledge and literacy was strong. And so many of them defied those laws to teach themselves and others helped to educate slaves as well, even though it was against the law. Women were obviously not as equitably recognized in educational settings as men. And yet still we had high levels of literacy at the time. 
Yeah, I just found some of that to be pretty surprising, worth fitting in here. And I'm not sure what the literacy rate is today, but I definitely thought people were much more illiterate in the past. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to know. I guess it, it would probably be a little bit anachronistic to kind of compare literacy rates then and now, different kind of standards of literacy. But certainly when we see some of these standardized test scores coming out of different parts of this country, you know, it's hard to say that we're actually quite a bit more literate, even though, of course, kids are spending so much more time in compulsory schooling settings, and yet not necessarily having the outcomes that education reformers would want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right about it being a little difficult to compare. I think even the quality of literature and the quality, the complexity even of like what kids might have been reading then or people in general then versus now, it's quite different. But while we're talking about reading and writing, critics of the unschooling movement might say that self-directed learning is great for kids. Sure. If you're interested in bugs this week, let's learn about bugs. If you want to know how concrete works next week, we'll do that. But eventually we have to learn to read and write. Eventually we have to learn things kids might not want to sit down and learn. What would you say to that? And just the, the idea of contrasting teaching reading versus learning reading. Yeah, I mean, I guess a couple of things there. You know, one is just this sense within unschooling and self-directed educational philosophy that if you allow individuals to pursue their own passions and interests, they'll learn through that process. So if a child is interested in bugs, like you said, they'll want to, you know, read about bugs and learn about bugs and discover more that way. So it's an entry point into learning, reading and writing and arithmetic through their interests, but it's all driven by them with their ability to opt out at any time and kind of move on to another interest. So it's this kind of bottom up educational approach instead of a top down approach of saying this is what you're going to learn in this way at this time with this specific assessment model. And the other point that I make in the unschooled book is that unschooling doesn't mean that you're never using formal curriculum or you're not learning in what we would consider a traditional way. It just means that you're choosing that curriculum or that standard approach. So you will find many students who learn in unschooled environments or Sudbury model schools, which I talk about in the book quite extensively, and other kinds of self-directed learning settings that, you know, as children certainly get later into their childhood and adolescence, they may have goals to attend college or to achieve some kind of career goal. And then they'll start, you know, studying for the SATs or taking community college classes or potentially even doing what we would consider a conventional high school curriculum. But it's, again, all driven by them with their ability to quit, with their ability to exit if that's not what they want and to shift gears. And it's in some ways giving young people the same level of respect as individual people that we would want as adults, right? That if we are, you know, not happy, for example, in a specific job or specific career path that we have the ability to quit. We have the ability to move on to something different. And it's sort of providing that same sort of freedom and flexibility to young people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good points. And the parts of the book that talk about reading, I just thought were really interesting because you have people who have studied this and their assessment is that kids learn to read not necessarily are taught to read. It's kind of weird to think about, but we kind of assume you send your kid to school and the teacher teaches them to read over time, but we don't necessarily have much of a comparison as to what would have happened if we didn't send them to school and we just introduced them to stories they liked and kind of let them self-direct their own reading ability. But experts seem to say that reading isn't as as much of a, a taught skill as it is just a naturally learned skill that we don't need to be taught to read from some authority figure necessarily. And I don't know, I just, I never really thought much about that, but it was pretty interesting. Well, there's always discussions on the reading wars, right? I mean, we heard actually there was just a renewed interest in the reading wars. It's phonics versus whole language and the pendulum typically swings back and forth depending on uh, the expert consensus of the day. But one of the things that, you know, I talk about in the unschool book is just how children would learn to read and gain natural literacy outside of a standard school setting. So there's one 
kind of category of talking about what's the best way to teach reading or to have children be literate within a standard school system. And that's where I think some of the debates today come from, whole language versus phonics. But if we can remove that whole paradigm of education from a standard setting and think about how children learn outside of conventional schooling. It's a completely different ballgame. And that's where, you know, for example, I talk about research in the book, looking at young people who've learned outside of a conventional school setting, researchers in England finding that the average age of proficiency for reading, meaning a child could read almost anything that they're given, is about eight and a half. If we think about a bell curve of reading competence, it would start, you know, kind of early, maybe an early reader around four years old, and then a late reader, maybe 11 years old, and kind of the bell curve, the the middle of the bell curve would be around eight and a half. And like I mentioned earlier in our discussion, Greg, you know, today's expectations in standard schooling sessions, in standard schooling settings for literacy really are at the far left of that bell curve, really expecting now four and five-year-olds to be learning to read and reading proficiently, even though, again, maybe it's more closer to eight and a half. But if you had an eight and a half-year-old in a standard public school setting that was not reading proficiently, it's very likely that they would be labeled with a reading delay or a reading disability when it could just be that they're not quite ready to read. Yeah, yeah. Or they're just disinterested as well. That's another huge factor. And if I can just add one other point to that, sure. put a fine point on it, is one of the things you hear over and over, and I talk about this in the book as well, is that those quote unquote later readers, those children that read maybe at eight or, or later, tend to become very proficient readers very quickly. So they may not be reading at all or very little. And then once they hit that kind of peak point of proficiency, they're reading Harry Potter within a couple of weeks. And that's an interesting anecdote that I heard over and over, and that's also captured in in some of these data. Yeah, yeah, great points. There's examples in the book where kids who are late readers end up reading way more complex stuff way sooner because once they decide they're interested in it, it kind of takes off. And I have developed an interest in the work of Rudolf Steiner to a degree, and some of the stuff he says about education is just, I really like things I don't expect to hear. And he has some really off the wall ideas. And one of them is around reading. Like he didn't think kids needed to learn to read until way later that the structure of language and reading actually hindered their creative spirit. And I've thought about Waldorf schools as an alternative. And then when I hear about that, I'm like, "Ah, I don't know. There's also a couple other things I don't love, like having to sign a document that says there'll be no technology in the house. It's like, okay, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not Amish. We're going to have a little technology around. That doesn't mean I want iPads in the classroom, but, you know, it is what it is. There's uh, a lot of these alternatives, Montessori, Waldorf, you find, and in the book you talk about this, they're different, but not necessarily different enough. They're still built on similar scaffolding and a similar foundation to traditional schools. And unschooling is really a much bolder and much more different situation. Maybe you could talk to us about that through a couple of stories about your own kids, because I've heard you tell stories about how this has worked. And that really uh, sounded like it's working pretty well for you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. So we have these alternative learning models that are very child centered, Montessori and Waldorf being two examples. You're right that in many Waldorf schools, they don't even begin to teach reading until much later than children would learn to read in traditional schools because they do recognize that bell curve of reading competence and do kind of push it more towards the center of the bell curve there. So that's interesting. And and they're just, they're beautiful educational philosophies. You know, one of the things I often say is that my preferred educational philosophy and approach is self-directed education and unschooling, but my larger priority is to expand the amount and diversity of education options that families are able to access. You know, I have my preference, but other families might find that something else is a better match for their child's individual needs and interests or their family's you know, vision and values. And and that's great. And I think that's what's so exciting right now about the micro school movement and education entrepreneurship more broadly is we're just seeing this abundance of options and diversity of options ranging from these unschooling learning centers and micro schools to Montessori micro schools to classical models of micro schooling. 
you know, kind of something for everybody. So that's just great to see. And it really is just about what individual families preferences are. But in terms of unschooling and self-directed education, you know, I write a lot about in the book about my children's experiences of kind of learning outside of schooling through, you know, following their own passions and interests. I talk a lot about the Sudbury model of schooling modeled after Sudbury Valley School, which was founded in 1968 and continues to exist today. My younger kids actually attend Sudbury Valley and Sudbury, the Sudbury model has now expanded across the world to dozens of other Sudbury style schools. And Sudbury was modeled after the Summerhill School, the famed Summerhill School that was founded in England in 1921 by A.S. Neal. And then A.S. Neal ended up writing a book in 1960 called Summerhill School, a new view of childhood that ended up selling about 2 million copies in its first decade in print and inspired other educators like John Holt, who I mentioned earlier on was the person who coined the term unschooling, as well as Paul Goodman, who wrote Compulsory Miseducation, and Ivan Ilyich, who wrote The Schooling Society, and so on. So it's interesting just to see where all of this kind of fits into the self directed, the modern self directed education movement today. Mm. Very interesting. And in terms of your own kids, I've heard you say that I think it's your oldest daughter. She started in martial arts on her own direction. And then from there was interested in Korean culture and language. And then from there, you just found someone locally who speaks Korean as a first language and set up meetings with them. And now your daughter has learned Korean. Yeah. Yeah. That's a perfect example of there was a new martial arts studio that was opening in our neighborhood. And she expressed interest in what was happening there. They had a little TV that was just kind of showing the martial arts moves. And she was like, oh, that's interesting. I want to know about that. I think she was about 11 at the time. And so she ended up walking in and talking with the person who was running the martial arts studio and took a introductory lesson and fell in love with martial arts. She now has her black belt. Mm. Here we are probably over five years later. And yes, through that process of learning martial arts and really committing to that, she became interested in Korean culture and history and began reading more about that and then did some Korean language classes that are on Duolingo, which is a free online language learning platform. She loved that, but then wanted something a little bit more rigorous. So then I was able to find her just kind of through community networks here in Boston a native South Korean speaker who she met with periodically to learn Korean language. So, and she still loves languages as a result of that. But that's another example of what I was saying before that unschooling is not necessarily not using curriculum or using instructors and kind of these sort of formal metrics of what we would consider with education. It just means that it's all self chosen. Yeah, I think that's really, really interesting, especially that you just use your local network. I think that needs to happen more and more in our society because we kind of got away from it with these big overarching mega corporations just standardizing everything for us. And it also probably speaks to why so many kids, myself included, go through school and come out and people finally start asking, well, what do you want to do with your life? What are you interested in? And it's like, I don't know. I never even got m much of a chance to think about it. Everything's been kind of thrown at me, and it's probably a factor. There's also kind of a psychological issue, I think, that parents probably deal with of letting go to a degree. Maybe letting go isn't the right term, but another example, another place where this happens is staying in jobs that we don't like because we're afraid of the unknown. We can't quit because we just don't know that other job, that next thing. It could be worse than this, even though this is bad. And I'm sure that happens in this case, too, when you talk to new parents that are like, yeah, I know the public education system is in the toilet, but I went through it and I managed to come out OK. Maybe I should just put my kid in it because this unschooling thing, it's so unstructured. It's I just don't know about it. And again, the unknown is scary to people. Do you end up having to deal with that, that there's parents who know the system is suboptimal, but at least it's what they know? Well, come on, Greg, you must have known that you would be a podcaster when you were <laughs> oh, in elementary yeah. school, right? I mean, of course, but it's a perfect example of we don't even know what the jobs will be uh, mm. 5, 10, 15 years from now, right? So we have a conventional system of schooling that has set expectations and kind of arbitrary 
curriculum goals that may be completely mismatched with the jobs of the future. And we're not kind of helping kids to develop those curiosities and critical thinking skills and agency kind of the sense that they're in charge of their own destiny that will really enable them to identify and adapt to whatever kind of economic conditions might exist at the time and whatever new opportunities might appear in the marketplace. And I think you make another really interesting point that is so crucial is I think a lot of us, you know, went through, I went through public schools, K to 12, and, you know, kind of got good at playing the game of school, you know, again, regurgitating for the teacher and the test what they wanted but not really kind of internalizing this love of learning because it was much more about conformity and compliance in school than about creativity and curiosity. So I think a lot of us as adults might look back on this and say, well, that's just what school is. Like you just have to grin and bear it. And instead, I think I'd urge parents to say there is another way. Like your kids don't have to, well, first, they shouldn't be miserable in school. There are joyful learning spaces and ways in which children can learn and develop that are just filled with joy and happiness. And that should be a priority for parents. But the other thing to think about is that, you know, is it really worth having your kids sort of leave their creativity and curiosity at the schoolhouse door, right? And trade creativity for compliance and kind of learn to color in the lines and stay in a straight line and all of that when they're walking from class to class? Like, is that really what's going to help them achieve what a parent would want them to achieve in later life? And that achievement, you know, is very much around, I think, personal agency, self-actualization, human flourishing. And I'm just not sure that kind of the standard system of schooling can facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. And I guess before we really start wrapping this thing up, these are podcast listeners, and you said you're upping it to two a week. There are a lot of really good stories on your podcast, personal stories from people. Are there particular episodes that you thought were personal favorites that maybe people should start with if they wanted to jump into an episode or two? Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the podcast is The Liberated Podcast. You know, I did one at the end of November that I referenced in our discussion today. Greg, that is about these micro school founders in Jackson, Mississippi, where the daughter is off of her anxiety and ADHD medication. So that was episode 51 in November 29th. That would be one to really think about. And then, you know, I mean, I think they're all, <laughs> they're all so interesting. I can kind of take a peek of what sort of works for, you know, particular interests. There's one that I did in early November from a visit in Kansas on microschooling and neurodiversity. So mm -hmm. microschool founders creating an intentional microschool community for neurodiverse students, students with autism and ADHD and other kinds of disabilities. That was a really, I thought, inspirational one. There's another one with the founder who I mentioned is whose goal is 100 schools in 10 years. So just kind of poke around and, and see, but just some great words of wisdom there from entrepreneurs across the country. Yes, yes, I love it. Well, Carrie, this has been really awesome. Of course, Unschooled is the book. Tell them about any other irons in the fire that you have that they might want to follow up on. Yeah, so right now I'm just working on a lot of storytelling around these entrepreneurs who are building innovative learning models, continuing to travel. We'll be doing more travel in 2023 to different cities across the country, meeting with these clusters of education entrepreneurs telling their stories at Forbes and in my columns at Fee. I also have a, a weekly email newsletter that digs into kind of deeper issues around the podcast guests and also kind of educational trends from this fresh perspective, maybe a non-traditional, unconventional perspective. So love to have people follow me there. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks again. I am happy to see people taking back their power in a lot of different ways. And education is one of the big areas where it's most important. And maybe we will see the fruits in 20 years when our next generation is more creative and less constricted. But uh, this was great. Keep doing what you do and take care. Thanks, Greg. Heck yeah. Heck yeah, Ironside Chatters. So glad I put this one on the calendar.
I think I originally learned about Kerry when I was preparing for the John Bush interview. He had Kerry on his show, and I just thought she was great. Not only knowledgeable and a wide range of creative things happening outside the standard educational box, but also being a podcaster means I know she'll have a decent audio setup. It's hard to not at least consider that when thinking about who to bring on. So I'm glad she was willing to talk on a show with a name like The Higher Side Chats, given that she's a serious person doing serious things. Anyway, also a big thank you to the Plate Scrapers, the Bluegrass Boys of Virginia, for that opening theme cover. If you like that kind of music at all, check them out. Their YouTube channel has some great stuff. Someone in their circle definitely knows a lot about audio, because even their music videos, the audio is just so crisp, it's hard not to love it. They actually did an original theme for me back in the day when we were doing it like that, and then they were the first to send me a cover of the one we're using now, at the time that it came out, and basically spawned this whole idea of trying to collect more and more covers of it, so I appreciate that they did it first, and uh, for the idea. But yes, even before I had a kid, I was kind of big on this education topic. The history is spelled out so well that obviously there was an ulterior motive to compulsory schooling that wasn't just trying to produce the best and brightest. And our education is so critical to how we think as adults. A lot of those patterns that are established then carry on through the rest of our lives. Carlin summed up a lot of this really well. In the early 2000s, it's about three minutes. I'm just going to play it. But if you talk to one of them about this, if you isolate one of them, you sit them down rationally, you talk to them about the low IQs and the dumb behavior and the bad decisions, right away they start talking about education. That's the big answer to everything. Education. They say we need more money for education. We need more, more, more books, more teachers, more classrooms, more schools. Uh, we need more testing for the kids. And you say to them, well, you know, we've tried all of that and the kids still can't pass the test. They say, oh, don't you worry about that. We're going to lower the passing grades. And that's what they do in a lot of these schools now. They lower the passing grades so more kids can pass. More kids pass, the school looks good, everybody's happy, the IQ of the country slips another two or three points, and pretty soon all you'll need to get into college is a fucking pencil. <laughs> Got a pencil? Get the fuck in there, it's physics. <laughs> then everyone wonders why 17 other countries graduate more scientists than we do. Education! Politicians know that word, they use it on you. Politicians have traditionally hidden behind three things, the flag, the Bible, and children. No child left behind. No child left behind. Oh, really? Well, it wasn't long ago you were talking about giving kids a head start. Head start, left behind. Someone's losing fucking ground here. But there's a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks. And it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's never going to get any better. Don't look for it. Be happy with what you got. Because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. The real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. That's right. They don't want people who are smart enough to sit around the kitchen table to figure out how badly they're getting fucked by a system that threw them overboard 30 fucking years ago. They don't want that. You know what they want? They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. People who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept all these increasingly shittier jobs with the lower pay, the longer hours, the reduced benefits, the end of overtime, and the vanishing pension that disappears the minute you go to collect it. And now they're coming for your social security. Security money. They want your fucking retirement money. They want it back. 
so they can give it to their criminal friends on Wall Street. And you know something? They'll get it. They'll get it all from you sooner or later because they own this fucking place. It's a big club and you ain't in it. You and I are not in the big club. Mm-mm-mm. And people always do remember that last line, but so much of the entire bit is about education. It's getting worse and worse, and they don't care. The only thing I think he said that was slightly incorrect is that it can't be fixed. Education as a government institution? Yeah, sure. And I, I know that's what he really meant, but the hope and opportunity is in what's going on in Carrie's world. So whether you have kids or not, I would hope that you'd find this interesting because any signs that we might find a way to turn this ship around in 20 years is based on what we're seeing happening with the kids today. So even if you don't have your own, maybe you have friends or family that have kids that might be searching for a person like Carrie and the unschooling movement. Or perhaps you just know people who are actual teachers who have had complaints recently and could benefit from a realignment of their careers with some of this stuff. I suspect that everything from social media to the politicizing of the classroom is really going to screw things up for a long while before they get any better. But unschooling and some of the truly alternative models do make me long-term optimistic. And who really knows what we'll be dealing with by then, but I see at least something to be positive about in the big shift out of the system. It never served us anyway, right? So why do we trust it with our kids, and why do we keep going back to it? Not really much more complicated than that, is it? So if you want more of this kind of thing, her podcast, Liberated, goes deep on so many various personal stories attached to this unschooling movement. It's really great. Education, of course, is a core element of how we got in this mess that we have today, where so many critical thinkers feel like they're on an island in their families and friend groups, which makes it an important thing to cover. If you liked the first hour this week or any week, sign up for THC Plus and hear the second hour of all of these interviews. Today, we talked about Common mistakes that first-time homeschoolers tend to make. Common psychological barriers that parents experience when committing to unschooling. The Arizona Universal Education Savings Account Policy. Quite creative. Learning risk versus danger for young kids. Research on bullying and its relation to the structured environment that they are in. The homeschooling socialization fallacy meeting the unique needs of teenagers and the major failure of conventional schooling, and some advice for those teachers that would like to transition to an unschooling career. We always get into a lot of good stuff with that extra time, and THC Plus is only 8 bucks a month for the five shows I put out, less than a dollar an hour, which is a popular metric in the value-for-value value model. And I spare you all the stupid ads that the other shows are doing, which has to be worth something, right? <laughs> I think it's the best deal in podcasting, and it kicks off with a seven-day free trial. Hop on in and treat yourself. We cover more ground in two-hour interviews than some shows could do in four. The plus comment section is always active, and you can rate episodes along with everyone else that I consider when picking future show topics. And you get an RSS feed link that you can plug right into the majority of podcasting apps and most likely the one that you're listening to me on right now. TheHigherSideChats.com, pull it up in your mobile browser, it's quite easy. And to the actual Plus members, I can't thank you enough. You really are the muscle behind this show in a lot of ways, and you keep the train chugging along, hopefully for all my remaining years. Before we go, it's important to look at the events that you guys have created at HiresideMeetups.com, a free and open meetup calendar available to any THC listeners who want to form a stronger local community based on a mutual love for the sort of things we talk about around here. You do have to make an account. It helps us prevent spam, and also it's just good to have a person running point on any event that shows up on the calendar. But it is not just for plus people, and in fact, it's totally separate. Your plus account is not ported over there. 
I've seen some confusion in both regards. So just to set the record straight, it is for anyone and it is separate from any person's plus account. It is just a basic account that you would make that is required for putting events on the calendar and also for RSVPing, which is just good form. It's polite. You want a person to know how many they should expect. But it is typically a good time from what I hear. And next on the list, we got the Los Angeles Truthers on January 12th going to Flame International Restaurant once again. January 13th, the National Friday the 13th meetup in Nevada City at the National Bar. Also January 13th, the Sinspiracy Monthly Mad Tree Brewing Meetup for THC fans in Cincinnati, Ohio. January 14th, Denver, Colorado. They are having a book swap on top of just getting together. Also January 14th, the Williamton THC Meet and Greet at Williamton Brewery Company in Williamton, North Carolina. January 15th, we have a meetup in Sandy, Utah at Athena Beans. January 17th, would you look at that? Someone put one on the calendar for San Diego at Society Brewing. I will just be getting off a plane from a trip I'm taking to New Orleans with some buddies of mine. But it's going to be hard to miss one right here in my hometown. We'll see what happens. And then for the rest of January, we have some in Philadelphia, one in Portland, and one in Guatemala. How interesting. If you're in any of those areas, hop onto the site and get the details as well as RSVP. And if there's not one in your area, hop on the site and add it to the list. And that said, it was great to have a solutions-focused show today. It is how we win. What is the counter-reaction to seeing the world that's being built for us? We can't just stare at it in awe and say we don't want it to show up because it tends to. But if we want to build a better way for ourselves and those who are on our page, well, it starts here in education. So I really appreciate what Carrie does. Let her know if you do too. And I guess I'll say that I've done my part. Your Move State Curriculum Crafters, Obedience Training Teachers, and Pawn Making Public Educators. Your fucking move. Oh no, you see, the world isn't random, it's attached to puppet strings, control over everything. Nine to five is trying to steal ya Now don't that job seem silly Hello, can you hear me? Or should I play back recordings From some spike agency Wish we were 